Welcome back to a sad episode of Why Blank Lost for Big Brother 25. I'm David Bloomberg, and with me once again is, of course, my co-host, Ovi Kabir, who was 10 years old when Sheree was on our TVs <laughs> for the first time. 10 years old, but I still remember it like it was just yesterday, David. Yeah. Uh, I wish I I wish I had roses, honestly, for you, because I know what a hard week it has been because a legend has unfortunately left the Big Brother house. Yes, yes. And that's why, you know, normally I wouldn't wear a Survivor shirt on a Big Brother podcast, but I've got my heroes <laughs> versus villains. Wow. Shirt in her honor. OG right there. That's right. That's right. Now. While you were playing on the merry-go-round at grade school at the time, <laughs> I've talked about why Suri lost Survivor four times before, three on my old website and once with Rob on a podcast. I also discussed, in a way, why Suri won the Traders on the Tradar podcast, but not specifically using this format. In the past, that was always using the Survivor version of my rules, but now we're here to evaluate her in this Similar but different game. Comparing her play to the Big Brother rules I originally wrote when you were eight years old and have modified <laughs> ever since. You have the receipts. Wow. <laughs> we'll, we'll look at what we saw on TV, live feeds, interviews, and other information. And the most recent version is, of course, posted at robhasawebsite.com slash rules. <laughs> I love that. Wow, David, I, did, I didn't realize you were over 27. So Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like a day past 28. So. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you might want to have your eyes checked. Uh, <laughs> now, we usually have some other things to discuss about the week in general. With so few people left, unfortunately, the only thing I have is the poor behavior of Jag, Matt, and Bowie Jang. And I know a lot of people have discussed this, and you can find the specific clips online. It's just so tiring to me both matt and jag had a nice guy image through most of the game even though matt of course had some clear issues that we and others have already discussed but as numbers in the house declined they they got worse matt made comments which kind of go along with his previous comments about women like talking about oh america must not be very smart because she didn't even know how to cook or do laundry yes matt because that's all women are good for um, and then, you know, Jag had ideas about how to be a complete a-hole to Felicia. And luckily, most of these didn't go through. But, you know, we'll discuss when we get to the jury phase how some of them did. And then Bowie Jane, who on uh, on uh, uh, Thursday's episode kept saying, it's all game. It's all game. It wasn't personal. On the live feed she showed, it is personal, and it's very nasty side of herself, considering how she would cry, you know, at just being left out of an alliance before, and then she turns around and talks about people this way. It's ugly, and I'm kind of over all of them. I mean, don't get me wrong, when one of them likely wins next week, I'll still be as objective as always, but they're going to have to do some work afterwards to account for their behavior. Yeah, I mean, it's it's quite unfortunate because I think as the season has gone by, as viewers, we have really gone to enjoy Matt and Jag um, and seeing their personalities as kind of, you know, as kind of humans in the house. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's getting it's gotten a bit ugly these last couple one these weeks, but especially this past week, because it's unneeded. Two things. Right. It's one. Um, objectively speaking, we'll talk about this later on. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> for people for people who are on the audio the reason we're laughing at a very strange time is all of a sudden balloons just popped up on Ovi's camera for some reason we don't we don't know why we've been it's like an easter egg every week we get yeah. a new like a little uh, yeah, and then this one was ill-timed in the past yeah. you, a thumbs up when you were giving a thumbs mm -hmm. up a thumbs down but balloons when you're talking about <laughs> this topic yeah o Ovi's I, camera you messed that one up yeah, we I didn't plan that one. Uh, but with that being said, I think it, it's gone ugly this past week. It's it's kind of apparent to see that. And the reason I have both an issue of it, one is just like there's no need for it. You know, I, I think really keep game game. This has mm -hmm. no point in game. But objectively speaking, which we'll talk about um, later in the rules, this is bad 
uh, objectively for the game. You know, you are trying to uh, have these jurors feel a good way about you and not this way. And more than anything, I think just the optics are just really horrible. You you have uh, two young mm-hmm. men, right? Uh, plus Bowie Jane, who's, uh, you know, 35 years old. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, yeah. <laughs> um, so young people uh, who are just kind of just being unneedingly cruel to mm-hmm. the are, are the two older women in the house who are left there you know um it's just not needed there's no really game attempt i, I understood i heard somebody say that well they want to throw them off so they don't win the next hoh or veto competition whoever is left and just kind of really get to them in there um i mean that was feels, the excuse they made but yeah come on it's it's, it's not needed i mean yeah. it, it's it's truly not needed and yeah. yeah it's just uh it's putting a little bit because i'm kind of in the minority i know on this one i've been enjoying the season just as a whole even to the end game um just seeing how storylines are progressing this puts a little sour note in my mouth yeah definitely and it's yeah i mean we've talked about this before there's a tendency to vilify the person you're going to vote out because it makes you feel better about doing it but this is just going beyond the pale you know and it's the difference of doing that final five right you know that's kind of a early game mid game and maybe in jury like right but final five you're really trying to bolster your evictees who are walking out of the door but like I really loved your game. I really appreciated you. Uh, had to do this so I could make it to the end. I hope you understand. Versus like, let's uh, let's you know hit pots yeah. and pans and keep them up all night. Yeah, yeah. So besides that depressing topic, did you have anything else you wanted to discuss before we move to our next segment? No, I think I'm very excited for this segment. Okay. So well, then it's on. time for Julie Chen Moonves is wrong about blank, Somewhere. and I just want to point out. Julie production. This is me saying it, not Ovi. So make sure that you keep him in mind for the upcoming Legends <laughs> season at the beginning of 2024. <laughs> yes. Uh, when, when you think of Legends, you think of me. Obviously, yes, first. obviously. Yes. So I just want to make sure you're Thank insulated. You. From I appreciate my it. thoughts here. Um, Very kind of you. So, so this is almost a rerun because Julie once again talked to Dalton Ross about who she believes is doing well and. She based it entirely on comp wins. Uh, First, she talks about Ceri's weakness being that she was bad at comps. And yeah, you know, that's because in part production didn't even give her a chance for 90% of them. Um, Then she said Bowie Jane had a great resume because she won three HOH comps. Which is, quite frankly, idiotic. Because she's done literally nothing in the game other than winning the virtually identical challenge three times over. And those of those three, let's recap here. One was by accident. One was thrown to her. And, okay, she won the last one. Congratulations. Um, and then Julie also credits Jag winning cops, comps more than Matt using his social game to avoid being nominated. After all these years, the host of Big Brother still doesn't understand what Big Brother is actually about. Hey, you're going to have the Bowie Jane stands come at you because we have a three-time winning queen. You know, once is a coincidence, coincidence, twice. We don't know it three times in a row. Well, actually, not a row, but close yeah. enough. You know, uh, she, she's putting up something together. Come at me, Bo. <laughs> I, um, I I think you're correct, though, in that whole assessment. I think it's just kind of very um, Jeff Probst like where uh, they love to see, you know, the the challenge beast and i feel like we've we've talked about i think a lot of other podcasts has talked about this kind of the meta changing into very um uh competition forward uh winners yeah. or uh players and i just think it's unfortunate in a way that uh it really discredits a lot of the social game aspect uh matt has done here i mean yeah. it's it, Granted, I mean, it is really awesome that Jag has been able to win as many as he has. I don't mm-hmm. want to take that away from him. I think that's really awesome, incredible that the numbers he's, I think he's going to, he's tied the competition wins record and he's won the veto 
uh, yes, with the uh, with the big asterisk that he was actually voted out of the game. He, before he was, yeah. He he. <laughs> there, there is that factor too. Um, but with that being said, you know it, it's interesting. But I think, like you, you know, ultimately though, it's just it's weird for our host to kind of lean into that uh, where these are like the big portions of their game. That's all she knows, though. I mean, yeah. she doesn't know anything about Matt's social game. She doesn't know anything about anybody's game really except the numbers that are in front of her and you know so she probably has no idea how matt jag and bowie jane have been behaving and this is something i forgot to mention because it has been completely hidden from the tv viewing audience mm -hmm. if you only watch the tv shows you have no idea how they have been playing how they have been behaving because cbs doesn't want you to know CBS knows that one of them is going to be the winner in all likelihood. And they don't want you to feel about the winner the way we felt about the winner of your season. Um, now, I'm not saying it would ever go to those lengths. I, I'm yeah. Just, you know, but they they don't want that information to be shown to the majority of the people who only watch the TV show. So they they filter it. They hide it. They, you know, scrub up their images. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's very, we've seen it so much, each season is getting more curated and more, more created, but I feel like the unfortunate part is that the episodes, I, I felt like early season, you know, I know this is kind mm -hmm. of off topic, but early season, the show, I was kind of impressed, uh, was doing a good job of showing us characters and kind of what they were doing what they were thinking aside probably izzy which was a shame because you saw so much more yes. if you watched the feeds and you mm -hmm. saw the episodes but now i really feel like it's running past the social elements of each of these players and it's completely focusing on the comp wins the drs are specifically surrounding the comp wins or things that annoy each them uh it's just i there's such a cool social element that's been going on mm -hmm. and i wish we could kind of look more into the show showing why does Bowie Jane want to go and lose with Matt and Jag? And it's because of by part the social game of other players, but mm -hmm. also the by part the social game of Jag and Matt. And we really haven't caught in this voice only competition wins, competition wins, competition wins. Um, I know last week I was beating the drum saying, you know, uh, I don't think, you know, I don't think it's as extreme as others were saying of that stuff. But I think unfortunately the show is showing as extreme because they're really just pushing that angle. Yeah, yeah. And then they even have like they had Cameron in the jury say, well, the same thing that uh, Julie did. Well, Bowie Jane has a good resume. And it's like, yeah, it, it's good that um, Derek and Claire were uh, at the uh, Los Angeles live show uh, with Rob and Taryn. And they mentioned that when you're in the jury, you know, I mean, we've talked about this before. Mm -hmm. I've talked about with Survivor. They ask you different questions like. What would you say is a good reason to vote for this person? What would you say is a good reason? And then they use whatever clips they want. Yeah. CBS wants people to think all the people remaining, all the players remaining, have a chance at winning. So they don't want everyone to be saying, yeah, Bowie Jane is useless. Yeah. That, you know, because Bowie Jane could end up in the final two and they don't want everybody tuning out at the finale because they already know who the winner is, you know. Um, so, yeah, I'm sure that they, you know, say to each juror and why what would be a good reason for Matt to win? What would be a good reason for Jag to win? What would be a good reason for mm -hmm. Bowie Jane to win? And I would like the jurors to all say there is no good reason for Bowie Jane to win and just leave them with no content. I think that would be very funny, but. It never happens. They always try to please. So yeah, I mean, may, maybe here's the thing. I've been thinking about it more and more. I mean, yes, there's the editing, those things. I I'm curious though, if there is any world, which I don't think there is a world, but if Bowie Jane somehow still wins out, where would the jurors feel um, inclined? If she's if she's able to say if and this will go into prediction, I don't want to get too much. Yeah, I was gonna say we could talk about that in predictions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I'm curious to see if there's a world where they feel differently about her actually than we do. Um, of their I'll, I'll give you a hint. No, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that more. All right. Well, before we get to the rules themselves, I want to mention that 
the survivor version, which is even more appropriate this week because I have used the survivor version of these rules with Sari four times over. Uh, but the, the survivor version of the rules comes in a poster form, uh, much more colorful and shorter than the ones we're about to go through. You can go to robhaswebsite.com slash yxlostfeeds, scroll down to the poster and click on it. In addition to the poster, we have other ways you can get the rules so that you'll always have them with you. You can get the poster on a T-shirt and you can get the checklist on a T-shirt. The checklist, of course, very close to the Big Brother uh, rules themselves. Not quite. You know, there's a few things, but but close. Uh, so, again, that's robhaswebsite.com slash yxlostfeed. All right. Well, Suri should have been voted out in week two. There is no way anyone should have let her stick around mm -hmm. this long. But that's what she does. She makes it to the end and then something goes wrong. The question is whether the same sorts of things went wrong this time as have happened to her before. I have interviewed Suri three times, written about her survivor losses three times and podcasted about it once. Some of the things that she said or I wrote or said back then are quite pertinent to the game we saw her play this time. What were the similarities and differences? How did Jared being there impact her game? It's time to figure out why Suri lost. We start with the first and most important rule, which is to scheme and plot. Now, obviously, Suri knew the importance of this, and I can quote from my article on why Suri lost Heroes versus Villains from over 13 years ago. When I said, Suri was very well acquainted with the first rule. She knew darn well that this was more important than anything else and was even cited in the rule as a prime example due to her play in the first season. And yeah, I still have that example from her first season in the survivor <laughs> version of this rule, noting Suri showed that making alliances immediately is more important than anything when her, her tribe chose to keep her and her fear of leaves over somebody who could help them build shelter, start fire, get food, etc. And, you know, Big Brother doesn't have the issues of camp life in the jungle, but that doesn't change the importance of this rule overall. So moving up to Big Brother, you know, she was the center of every alliance in the house for quite some time earlier in the game. She was in the perfect spot. Almost everyone trusted her and came to her with information. She was in so many alliances that Izzy had to remind her of who was in which ones. <laughs> and each time she told people, that the other alliances were the fake ones, but this was the real one. As I said in our Why Heisem Lost podcast so long ago, it in a way it reminded me of Dr. Will. He told everyone he would lie to them, but then convinced each person that he was only lying to other people and telling whoever he was talking to the truth. Suri and company had all these fake alliances, but told each one they were the real alliance, even naming one for real for real. <laughs> which they later said was never for real. Uh, but I, I believe I said in an earlier podcast, Suri was the sun and the rest of the house was her solar system. Everyone orbited her constantly. Wow. Well, you know, I usually say beautifully put when you do a monologue at the end describing how the <laughs> eviction went on, how you feel about the player, but you've started as strong. And, I, you know, I, I want to take the moment to, uh, I think it's cool because, getting to talk about Sari in this aspect because I, I i never thought i would actually be able to talk about her mm -hmm. live playing a game like this um but i think even more so it's a testament to you david of how long and uh, incredibly informed you have been and keeping people knowledgeable of what's going on and your objective takes i mean it's so cool that you've been covering her for so long and you kind of can see this whole circular arc of her gameplay go on in each different season she's played so i think you know it's kind of cool i think it's hand in hand as much as i'm going to enjoy talking about sari I, I love hearing about just your takes so long ago about this that are still applicable today and i don't mean that in any shade so right long there. ago because you're so old <laughs> No shade there, David. I think it's cool. I, I just want well, to get the props you. there, get that out of the way there. <laughs> but uh, like you said, I mean, we, we, we saw her just emulate kind of perfectly in a way of how do you take a survivor game and put that into a Big Brother game? Um, and I think we saw elements of where there were struggles, but we just saw somebody who literally for being on a real like, you know, on our TV screens for almost 20 years now, um, use the same elements and somehow um she was able to kind of get away with it you know when i was putting my notes together for this one and trying to figure out how do i want to tackle this 
I was, I think, a little bit harsher on her on certain things because I was like, and, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this as mm -hmm. the rules go on, but she schemed and plot so well, but I felt Sari and Co., as we kind of dubbed it, uh, messed up a lot of ways on along the way. But I also think, I don't even know if she ever thought she was going to get this far. You know, she yeah. was expecting to be a threat out the gate. Mm -hmm. And so she just did what she knew best and was create alliances, social bonds, and we just saw her with a target on her back as big as the moon in the sense of whether people threw darts at it is to be questioned. Um, but something that when you come into the game, 17th house guest, um, a legend, people know who you are off the bat. And you're able to continuously plot with people and have people work with you. I mean, that's just a talent of its own. Yeah. And, you know. Going back again to when I interviewed Sari for her first Survivor appearance, she told me I wanted to fly under the radar until I was in a position to make any moves. Then after the second time, I asked her about that. I said, well, you said this the first time. Now, what do you say? And she told me I wanted that to be my strategy this time, but it was right away I had to make moves. With these people, the favorites I played with, you could not just sit around and wait for stuff to happen. I don't like to play that way, but I can adapt easily. I saw I had to do more and be proactive this time, so I was. And like you just said, she came in with a big target again this time. So that is the Suri we saw this time. I'm sure she would have rather stayed in the background, mm -hmm. but she's Suri effing fields. <laughs> and she had to protect not only herself, but her son as well. More on that later, but the interesting <laughs> thing is she played so differently in the latter part of the game. It reminded me of the difference in her play between Micronesia and Game Changers. She explained in interviews after the latter that she knew eyes were on her, and if she ever did something a little off, everyone would have seen you know, the strategy queen mm -hmm. for who she was. And she told Ro Rob on the red carpet she had to shrink down a little bit and still be part of the votes without standing out as the one leading them. And that was more of what she was doing later here, influencing without being seen as leading. And as just one example, because, I mean, we can't give as many examples as we want or we'd be here for hours. But one example later in the game, she was stoking the fires between Corey and Matt and Jag, mm -hmm. saying that it was so OK. She keeps them aiming at each other and she could sneak her way to the end, quote, like I always do. She almost got there. You know, as she described to Mike Bloom, she had to go into stealth mode and blend in like just another civilian rather than the four star general she had been. Exactly. I mean, I think what was really cool, we saw way, the way she schemed and plot that was unique to her on this season um, compared to other house guests. And mm -hmm. I, I always say that when you're coming back, say if you're as a returning house guest from all the people I've talked to and know, and we can see it is there's a different level of aura you have around you where you feel prepared for it. There's so many different things where when you're kind of caught up in the limelight of the show, because you've been wanting to be on it for so long, caught up in what's going on, the cameras on you, it's difficult to get your bearing mm -hmm. and scheme and plot for the long game. You start thinking of what can I do? short term i mean you have a long plan but when you get hit in the face you kind of scramble and try to figure out what to do to survive your game with sari we kind of saw i mean and again she was cushioned and i think we have to say there was explicit advantage with jared being there right she had somebody she knew she could intrinsically should have been able to trust <laughs> i'll give and, you my opinion on that later but yeah go ahead <laughs> And, and but what we saw is she was able to scheme and plot kind of for the long game and i mean i want to take it all the way mm -hmm. to which we could say retroactively it's a tough move but at the time it seemed like a solid interesting move was keeping jag around when she convinced matt to do that um and also uh, to when jag was initially voted out and he stayed there uh she had the foresight to think that he might be needed to be used later down the line we'll mm -hmm. talk about that down the line too um but also bringing matt into the fold even though she had a close group of other people yes. between izzy felicia Nicole. We, she was able to see what she needed to do weeks down the line in the first initial weeks, and that really set her game up moving forward. Yeah, and, you know, I I, I have thoughts about all those things scattered into the yeah. different rules, so we'll, we'll get to them. One of them, the JAG, saving JAG issue, I didn't know whether to put in the first or second rule. I'll explain why I put it in the second <laughs> when we get there. But part of this rule talks about the need to check in frequently. And Sari did an excellent job of that, talking to people all the time to the point 
that people who watched and recapped the live feeds, they never got a break for a while. Like, mm -hmm. never. As long as Sari and Izzy were awake, <laughs> there were no breaks. Um, other players like America, Corey, et cetera, they didn't check in as often. So down, sometimes they were passing along old news or even contradictory news because things had changed in the, you know, they were probably like, ah, I can pass this along tomorrow. Well, in one day, you know, that whole house could flip in the beginning uh, of the game. And so that meant they weren't keeping the connections they needed. And we saw this several times when Sari knew things quicker than anyone else and could dole out that information to the point that it circled back to the original person so quickly it shocked them. Yeah, I mean, she she was she. Uh, if you watched um, Game of Thrones, she was truly Littlefinger in the way she had her finger on every pulse of going into the house. I mean, it was really impressive because she was able to go up and down within the scheming and plotting of trying to get people to trust her. I mean, she had that intrinsical trust of people. Um, to make these type of moves. So my question though, David, within this rule, do you feel what were some shortcomings of her scheming and plotting? Well, it's funny you should ask because for a while it was all working great, but then came the Corey and Jared blow up. And Suri was of course hit as well when Corey brought up the alliances she was in. But once Jared was gone, she took her game in a different direction and got back into the good graces of pretty much everyone. Uh, you know, Jag talked about her being the most trustworthy. Blue said she was playing an honest game, etc. Sari took in a lot of information, but she wasn't like everyone else. You know, I know I just said we did a lot. She did a lot of check-ins and could pass information, but she wasn't running around and sharing it everywhere. <laughs> um, you know, and. So it's just one recent example when Jag blindsided America and Corey with the double back door. Sari immediately was commiserating with America while the others were outside celebrating. She listened as America was going on and on about different strategic pieces of information, alliances that she'd previously been in. Now, as it happened, none of that ended up helping uh, thanks in large part to the comp situation. But she was you know, playing the actual game of Big Brother. But that's not what you asked. You said what was a problem, mm -hmm. you know, and that started as a problem, but then shifted to a, mm -hmm. to, you yeah. know, to a recovery. But a problem was it was grueling as the days, weeks and months went by. And by the time it got to this week, there was a situation that she missed. When Matt won HOH, he had previously promised Suri safety. It was late after the comp. So she basically just went to bed. Meanwhile, Jag, of course, ran to Matt right away and lobbied to nominate Suri with Felicia. Others have already made the case that if she had gone straight to Matt, there might have been more pressure on him to honor his promise. I, I truly don't know if it would have helped or not. Uh, you know, especially seeing the way Matt caved to Jag later when it came to deciding who to vote out. I just feel like Matt never wanted to cause any possibility of a disagreement with Jag. So he gave in. And I think the same would have happened even if Sari had lobbied him right there. I, I think he would have said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Jag would have gotten to him. I mean, we'll never know, but it's still something she should have at least tried. Yeah, no, I think that was kind of the hardest part watching it in her game was we saw it burn so strongly in the initial weeks when she had all those people there but it was such a marathon and we, we'll talk about in the rule too where i feel like sometimes it was burning too quickly mm -hmm. but as the game went on and then what like you noted when jerry went home we saw such a different shift in her game for some of us i think we enjoyed seeing her be kind of in this killer instinct mode where she was out for blood but i do think after that happened she stopped thinking about how can i win this game and i'm not saying she completely dismissed it but she was thinking more so i want to get one revenge for jared um but two is like let me just 
live it through, you know? Mm -hmm. And she she self-professed that she was saying, you know, like, you know, I've done this before. At this point, I'm just not by done this before, been in the limelight, right. done these shows, right. you know. Um, and it, it just doesn't have the same flavor for it. And Big Brother this season, hundred days long, and we have a cast of people who, like we said, it was it was a house of whispers. It was always something going on. It never felt like there was ever a pause, even on the down weeks when it was zombie weeks. Mm -hmm. People continued to kind continue to plot and scheme and it takes an impact on you each week and you're in the house, especially if you start to feel like your allies are going out one by one and by one by one, which we kind of saw happen after the half game, Sari and co were uh, dem de dem decimated. Sorry, excuse me. And uh, I think we saw that happen to her where she just started making moves that were uh, let's just let the, let it go with the game, let it flow versus yeah. really controlling it. Yeah. 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 And, you know, so you mentioned that, you know, we, we have more to talk about as we go to the second rule. So uh, I'm ready to go ahead. And that one says not to scheme and plot too much and to keep your scheming secret. Now, the fact that Sari was in so many alliances and then Corey called them all out raises the question of whether that means she was violating that rule, this rule. And I'd say it's debatable because until Jared blew it, she was actually succeeding. Can we blame her for not foreseeing how poorly he would play it? Well, if if he if he wasn't her son, we'd say yes. She should have had a better handle on how her allies would behave. She clearly had a blind spot with him or she didn't want to overly mother him and tell him how to play every moment. But the fact is that his actions came back to haunt her. Yeah, I mean, uh I feel like, yes, his actions came back to haunt her. Jared, in many ways, uh, became not as trusted as an ally for her, especially with the blue situation, which I feel like, uh, and by blue situation, I mean, I think most people have context, but Jared basically was telling blue so many things yes. that he was t not telling Siri and basically spilled the secret. And he still continued to lie to his own mother about how she found out, or if mm -hmm. she actually knew there was definitely a way he could have tried to make that alliance uh, stronger in a way. It just come like fess up, Talk about it and work with your mama on this. Um, but I will say, I think in this rule number two, right, where we talk about over scheming, uh, over plotting, I mean, she did a little too much with the group she had. And I'm not saying that's completely Sari. It was the whole group thing between her, Felicia, and Izzy, that power three. And then you had some other people brought in. And Jared was in there. They did so many moves we saw week one, week two, week three, week four, where uh, we talked about Sari and Co. kind of would – burn their allies one by one by one without them realizing like Haisam, uh we saw him getting burnt we saw other people i mean the way they uh utilize that whole red vote out mm -hmm. um when they didn't really have to and you would think that it, it made Ceres target even bigger but she had some uh soldiers around her that took the <laughs> shots but i do think it gave a bad image for her for certain house guests. And really, honestly, because they went so strong like that, they were able to rally the other side to be against them. I mean, Corey in America saw what was going on, mm -hmm. was able to kind of bring Cameron in. Cameron was, I mean, a big force in getting out that whole Serene Co side of things because he was able to win and really take shots at them. I mean, I do think we could have seen a softer approach from Sari for these first four to five weeks because she just really just was, I think, bored and had complete control of the game and showed it. Yeah, I'm going to see. I still think that she was in general fine with those things. She had lots mm, of okay. alliances and everything. I have said through the whole thing. I know that I'm standing out here on an island. I had no problem with the Heisem vote out. I like Heisem. I think he's been, you know, funny outside the game, too. But I had no problem with that vote out in the grand scheme of things. I and again, I think it circles back to Jared because, you know, Sari herself told Julie after the eviction that Jared being there complicated her game. And I agree. And she had to Mike Bloom, when you play by yourself, it's all about you. What's best for you. You don't really have to consider what's best for another person in the game unless it's your ally. And even if that, it's only if it benefits you when it's your family member, whether it benefits you or not, you try to do what's best for their game, which could be harmful to your game. And I think that a lot of the moves you mentioned were to try to protect him. 
And I've said for a long time, he was a drag on her game and she always had to do extra scheming for him. And again, you mentioned the red vote. She specifically noted how she had to ensure red was voted out because sure, red was loyal to her, but he was starting to pick up on the lies that Jared had told. And that made him problematic. So she basically had to sacrifice her own chess piece to help her son for all the good it ended up doing, you know, and so, yeah, I mean, was she over scheming in that situation? Yeah, because she was scheming for more than one person, you know. Now, of course, some people will note, and you already mentioned this, that Jared helped her by giving her information. Mm-hmm. That is true. But she was the center of so many alliances. She got plenty of information from other places. She would have been just fine without him there. People would still have been rushing to tell her things. I mean, she'd have been better than fine, really. Uh, You know what? I just feel like it's kind of one of the situations. It's like you can't have your cake and eat it. um, Because in this situation, like, uh, we have Jared who really played – a pivotal point for her in those initial weeks with those first four weeks. And I know we've talked about, Oh man, uh, he did this, he did that. But I do think that she was able to create those alliances and bonds because she was having, I mean, Jared there from the other side, bringing the information and more than also she had Izzy there who, when they, she found a secret that kind of created a pact between all three of them there. I mean, yeah, I'm did. not saying it, it would have not. I, I just don't think, Sari would have been able to uh, um, put her authority over things without Jared there being those initial weeks. He kind of glued in these alliances and bonds much early game without making her as much of a target before. It could, and again, I mean, the argument yeah. could be it could have swung the other pendulum. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll obviously never know for sure. We've talked about this before. This isn't a choose your own adventure where you can yeah. go back and, uh, you know, or a computer game where you could be like, well, what if I made this move instead? Where would I go? Um, but, you know, yes, people say, and you just said, well, Jared brought her information from the other side. Uh, Let's not forget Cameron ratted out the whole other side. Independently from Jared. Okay. Cameron told all. So they had that information even without Jared. Izzy was the Suri super fan no matter what. I mean, yes, Mm -hmm. there was that bond and everything. But Izzy was going to glue herself to Suri whether Jared was there or not. That was always going to happen. Most of the alliances, I won't say, but many of the alliances were made without Jared. And Jared was kind of a de facto member of them or officially wasn't in them because she didn't want to give it away. And it wasn't until later that, you know, he kind of drifted into more of them. So, yeah, we'll never know for sure. But I think Suri F. and Fields would have done just fine. And like I said, better without him. And another reason was, as you mentioned, him spreading information. You know, Sari told Felicia at one point, I never played with people this stupid that tell everything. (laughs) And while she didn't name Jared as one of those people, I will right now. (laughs) You know, know, Sari's trying to make moves to bring some people in. Then, like you said, she would tell Blue or he, she would tell Jared. Jared would tell Blue. Blue would tell everyone. Mm. So in some cases, it countered the move she was trying to make. I, I, I see what you're saying. I do, don't do disagree to a point that I think that Jared was difficult on her game. And we'll never know, right? We'll never know right. uh, per se. But I think that coming in with such a huge target – it mitigated that, but regardless, I feel like I'm, for me, I'm push. Uh, I, I'm moving away from the point that I wanted to make. Was I also think though her? I, I, again, it comes back to that point where whether she felt like she was going to be safe uh, for very long. I think she felt like she had to really go strong in the beginning, which I understand that first week one and week two. But I do think we just saw – and I, I mean you're making the point she had to do it for Jared. But I do think there were a lot of points where 
she felt so insulated within her group. Mm-hmm. She stopped trying to touch base with other people outside of it, aside from Matt. And I, I think that's kind of where we see the pivot where um, I don't want to go too much into rule three, unless you have more to say. Um, well, yeah, you but- mentioned Matt. And I think that takes us to a topic that you had raised earlier. I said, we get to here. And that is one decision that I think really came back to bite her. Um, although, mm-hmm. After her interviews, I'm a little less solid on it. Uh, During the season, as we were watching, it seemed like Sari thought it was a good idea for Matt to use the power of invincibility to save Jag and that she pushed him to do it. Now, in her exit interviews, she said she wasn't in favor of it and wished she would have done more to stop him. As she told Mike Bloom, I kind of soft shooed around the issue because I felt like no matter what I said, Matt was going to use his power to save Jag. And I did not want to have to deal with that on the back end when Matt shared with Jag that I did not want him to save him. I wonder how much of this is kind of slightly changing memory on Suri's part, because I feel like in that moment, (laughs) Suri really did have more control over Matt. And he said things suggesting that he would do whatever she wanted. Plus, it seemed to be a solution to a problem that Suri was facing at the time of herself and Jared wanting to go in different directions with the Jag versus Blue vote. Remember, that was the only time they really butted heads on the outcome of a vote. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's because Suri was thinking with one head and Jared was thinking with another. Um, so it's it's hard to say if, you know, if this really fits in the second rule as scheming too much by having Matt do it, or we should have discussed it when you brought it up in the first rule mm-hmm. and said that she didn't scheme enough to stop him. My initial reaction was, again, she seemed to be in favor of it at the time. So that's why I put it here, despite what she's now said in interviews. Plus, within the game, Sari told America that Izzy called it from the beginning that Jag had to go and not listening to that was her only regret in the game. Now, I don't remember the full context of that. It's possible she was talking about another time, but the notes that I have written seem to indicate that she was referring to this situation. Yeah, and I mean, I think if we go back, I'm glad you brought this part back up Mm -hmm. because, I mean, I think if we go back to that week when we discuss it in place, we kind of chalk it up to them wanting to do something exciting uh, versus making uh, what we thought was an objective, logical move for their own game because there was two court parts of this, right? Uh, One, I completely... I'm on the side of she was the one who pushed this idea forward. I mean, I think we can look back and we saw the things... Mm -hmm. Matt was very laissez-faire on this. He he did not really assert his authority over this decision. In fact, I mean, for Matt, it might have been better to keep it, which we talked about, in the back of his pocket for one of the true mm-hmm. allies or for himself because he still had another week he could use right. super overpowered power as well. Yes. I mean, after the – so, I mean, it's kind of like a get-out-of-free-jail card um, that you just kind of give away. Mm-hmm. Uh, a super idol, the Tyler, Tyler, yes. Tyler Perry idols, per se, uh, if anyone knows that reference. But, but what I do think, too, is really interesting is that she didn't put in the time prior to making that decision with Jag to make him a true ally of hers when she was doing that. And that's why we felt like it was a bad decision more than anything, I felt. Um, and this is where the over-scheming, over-plotting comes in. She didn't have that relationship with Jag prior to it. And even after it, we see Jag kind of throw Sari under the belt. It wasn't until the whole group of them kind of talked to Jag and it's like, hey, if you keep talking bad about it, mm-hmm. like we're going to go, we're sending you out the door this next game. I mean, that's another conversation of the game of Jag of how he's become a phoenix where he has rebirthed himself literally Mm -hmm. physically and socially in the game. But more than anything, this is a perfect point of Sari kind of doing a little too much when not needed. Yeah. And I do want to say, you know, this was one time when I remember the feeds were being cut from what we saw. It was just, you know, like you described it. It looked like Matt didn't have much agency and was handing it over to Suri. But the feeds were being cut a lot when they were talking about this, as I remember. And so is it possible that we missed some things? Yeah, it is. It just doesn't seem that way. I just think maybe, you know, after all this time, her memory might have shaded it a little bit. But who knows? I can't say for sure either way. 
Um, but you also brought up another reason why it fits here in the second rule was that even after Jag was saved, he was immediately thinking about it. You said this. He had to be shut down. And the reason for that was, again, Jared, because he stupidly told Jag he'd be safe trying to make himself look good after Sari said, don't tell anyone. And so here's Sari trusting Jared. And then Jared runs off and tells Jag. And then Jag runs over and tells Sari. And then Sari has to go tell Jared, you screwed up. And then Jared screws up further by going back to Jag again. And like questioning him, like, did you tell anyone? Did you tell anyone? Yeah, I know you told Sari. And it's like, don't just shut up. <laughs> you know, and all of this, even even Jag, who at the time we did not think of as a good player, you know, not, no strategic genius there. Mm -hmm. um, even he could figure out that Sari was literally the only person who could have told Jared. And she was he was still asking her. How Jared knew about it, mm -hmm. you know, like a couple weeks later, this was, you know, another issue there of why it was doing too much again, involving Jared. And then one more issue that I have in this rule was Sri leaving Bowie Jane out of discussions of, and outcomes. Now, notice I said discussions and outcomes. I didn't say decisions because Bowie Jane didn't care about decisions. She <laughs> just cared about knowing where to vote. And we saw her get very upset after the red vote when she wasn't included. Uh, Sari and Felicia just didn't trust her. And I, I really can't blame them, considering the way Felicia, I'm sorry, the, the way Bowie Jane acted, like literally getting up and walking out of the room when, when Felicia was creating the, the Bye Bye Bitches. It's hard to know where someone like Bowie Jane stands. Now it's become clear. And eventually people figured out, oh, she just wants to feel included. And that's where she landed. But as Sari said, her relationship with Bowie Jane never re recovered from the red vote. No, it never did. I mean, I think we see more and more of the ramifications of leaving Bowie Jane out of the entire process. I mean, we see her change her entire game for a game of almost revenge. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, no, it was all game. Week, it was never personal. It, mm. Yeah. yeah, what they may say. Yeah, but it, it, it's it's. But at the end of the day, regardless of whether we feel about for Bowie Jane's game, that is an impact for Sari and other people because they made the mistake of really just you know, uh, it, you know, if we we might forget Bowie Jane initial weeks was there, they can't do that. They yeah. need to ensure that she is in the conversations and they have those um, productive relationships with them, and so it can kind of help them down the line. And just unfortunately, didn't happen. Yeah. Well, okay, I think we can move to the third rule, which talks about the need to be flexible. I it sounded like you were uh, getting ready to jump in with some things here, so I'll yeah, hand I, the floor I, to you. For me, I was wondering. I, we're not wondering, but I the whole I saw her flexibility a lot in certain points of the game, mm -hmm. and in some points she didn't do. It. And I feel like it was a active decision. It's a, there's no question about it. we know Sari Fields is able to navigate the game and change on a win when she wants to. But I do think this is where the part I will say with Jared being in the, sh uh, the game, I think that caused her internal conflict of in this rule of the flexibility. Because at points we saw her able to work with Matt and reach around the table and try to find somebody and bring him in there or pivot the votes, you know, from let's target blue, let's go for uh, Jag now because Jerry doesn't want that. But then there were times that uh, she was hellbent on trying to take out Corey in America after that whole situation happened, after Jared is evicted, that whole blow up. Um, or she has that situation like you talked about with Jag, where he's like, how did this information get back to me or, or back to uh, Jared, um, where she has to be so strict and not be able to kind of ever throw him down the, you know, throw him mm -hmm. down there. I mean, here's the thing is with a game like this, um, you have to be able to cut somebody else and just say, I am going to have to throw you under the bus because you are not helpful for me at this point. <laughs> she can never, and you won't ever do that to family in the game. Right. 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 So because of that, I think for me, she's half and half on this. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned, you know, that she obviously knew how to, you know, be flexible and yeah, back looking back at survivor game changers, 
Mm-hmm. We saw that she had both main alliances and side alliances. And indeed, that's something she's done through all her Survivor seasons. And clearly, that's how she was playing it early in the Big Brother house. I, I think she had more side alliances than main ones. Um, you know, back in Micronesia, I when I was talking about her loss, I noted that the key to this rule is you need to have your finger on the pulse of every member of the tribe. And Sari had that covered. Uh, not a tribe, just you know, house guests, uh, you know, switching to here. I, you know, uh, she was good. She mm-hmm. couldn't always do anything about it. Thanks to not having HOH or veto powers. But I, I think she almost always had a good idea of what was going to happen and how to try to, to maneuver things. Yeah, I mean, game-wise, I, I wouldn't disagree with you with this. She was able to kind of figure out how to do it. And I think this is the question, is, is this intentionality for her? There's no level of incapability of it. Um, but I guess, you know, I mean, we're here objectively looking at the reasons why Sari lost. So do we feel, though, that her lack of flexibility or decision to not be flexible in her decisions caused her to go home? Whether it was with Bowie Jane, whether it was with Matt and Jag, do you feel like there's anything she could have done in that realm within this rule to stop what happened? This past no, week? not really. Do you? No, not really. Either. I mean, other yeah. than like, the, you know, there's just the relationship making with Bowie Jane, I think. But at this point, he, she's such a big threat, right? You know, she's such a big threat. Yeah, um, we'll yeah, we'll get to that one in a yeah. couple of rules but, here. Uh, but, uh, the only thing I will say is that I do feel like after the conversation uh, Felicia had with um, Jared, where she told Jared that she actually wants to be his final mm-hmm. two, and then Jared went back to Sari and talked to him. I think that was week, I want to say around week five or six. It was right after that Cameron mm-hmm. red vote. Um, and when that happened, I do think Sari's complete demeanor towards Felicia changed. Um, she started kind of icing her out mm-hmm. just a little bit more, and that was reflected. And so I think that might have been one of the things where I just – she took certain things maybe personally, and I'm not saying she shouldn't have yeah. in ways, but I do think that kind of hindered her ability down the line with Felicia. Yeah, I feel like those two had such an up-and-down relationship that they, <laughs> they, did. You know, they, they rebounded from that, but in the meantime, Felicia was – throwing her under the bus and she was throwing Felicia under the bus and Felicia was throwing her toenails onto the bed. And, you know, I, I mean, it was a, it was definitely a, uh, it, it was back and forth. I don't know that that one instance really did it, but it was, uh, it was an interesting right. relationship. Uh-huh. So um, uh, it, it'll be even more interesting when Felicia gets out and sees the interviews that Sari did, you know, <laughs> the nails the nails the cooking yeah 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 all right well we could go to the fourth rule which says players should not let their emotions control them uh speaking of what we were talking about uh sari has many years of experience in making friends with people and then voting them out so i don't think she had any qualms about it i mean she had just come from the traders where she had made very close bonds with several people who she knew she was betraying at the end, and they would be very, very upset. Mm-hmm. They even tried to make her feel guilty about exactly that in the reunion. <laughs> but it's a game, and she played all of them in exactly that fashion as she should. Oh, sorry, I muted myself right there. <laughs> uh, sorry, let me get this. Yes, no, I mean, she... Um, she didn't uh, let any the only time she let like emotions kind of control her in these situations where I think when it came with Jared but she yeah. didn't take other things like personally with um, situations and if anything like you said she tried to make people look logically and rational at the decision like mm-hmm. at decision making I think I, the only thing I wish that you know she could have uh, I wish she matched her energy with some other players in the house where I think she could have had some really strong synergy for example I think like blue I think because of the relationship Jared and um Suri had uh, sorry Jared and blue had she was unable to kind of have a full game relationship with blue because she she was probably protective over Jared um, one way of just being a mother, but also two as him as a game player, not sure where Blue's head was at. So she always had that buffer of not being able to work with Blue because she just felt probably some sort of way about the whole situation there. Well, I mean, versus... she, yeah, she wanted Blue out, you know, yeah. for that reason, which I, 
I agree with her, actually, <laughs> but <laughs> not just because I wasn't a big fan of Blue, but just, uh, you know, Blue as a player also, I I could understand that. And the thing is, she has, in the past, taken this part of the rule kind of a step further. Not only did she not allow her emotions to control her, but she knew how to use the emotions of mm -hmm. others to control them. This is the woman who came up with the idea of getting Eric to hand over the immunity necklace. You know, back, you know, mm -hmm. way back in Survivor Micronesia. Why? Well, as she told me at the time, spending time with Eric, I knew he wanted everyone to like him. I knew if we could put the thought in his mind that everyone was going to see him as a phony and untruthful and it wasn't good for him, I knew the redemption thing would work on him. So she recognized the emotional status of others and knew how to manipulate it for her own benefit. Now, she couldn't get Matt to pull an Eric. But she worked on him. I think there's a lot of similarities between mm -hmm. Eric and Matt. And I I think that this time, though, her methods were just a little too well known. Like, yeah, we're not going to fall for that one. We've seen you or in most of their cases heard about you doing that. You know, I heard that you're even on a poster as rule number one, you know, so. No, I mean, I think that's a cool point you've made because I don't think we've ever utilized that portion of the rule within the aspect of how do you emotionally control other people because we always talk about it, don't let mm -hmm. emotions control you. But I think uh, with Matt, it's a perfect example that I thought was interesting that uh, – her relationship with Matt was looked at as motherly. He looked at her as, mm -hmm. you know, almost as the mama bear for him versus she really took that role away from Felicia where, you know, initially Felicia was kind of that mother role for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. It translated then to Sari and just so many elements from Blue down the line when they kind of bonded a little bit more to Matt, to other players, or even Corey at points, you know? Um so I think that was really interesting. I think one thing I think um, I will lastly say, I mean, here's this is a, such a difficult rule with her because she had the most emotionally connected person in the house with Jared, right? Right. right. So it's like situations with Corey that I feel like and this is kind of the story of Corey's life in the game. He wants to work with a player and they just want to get him out, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I think in that situation, this is one of those things where emotions really did control her demeanor with Corey in the sense that, I think they could have been a very scary duo, especially with America in plot. And if they had, when Sari had more people around her, they could have ran the house in a lot of other ways later, mid and mm -hmm. later game. But I think from, because of Jared, that just, she couldn't do that with him. And I, um, I agree with you. Although let's not forget that she called Corey a snake from like day one or two. So even before Corey's blow up with Jared, even when Corey and Jared were best buds before that blow up, she still didn't want to work with Corey. Uh, she just saw him as too big of a threat. Yeah. I, I mean, I agree with that, but also knowing the Suri we know from all the seasons, mm -hmm. right? I feel like she's somebody who would have pivoted, especially when she sees it go uh, like lower and lower. Mm -hmm. Like there's a difference between early game, if you'd say, yeah. then, you know, that portion where she, if she wants to get about. At that point, they were both kind of on an island at times, you know? Right. Um, and I think she's always played, like, keep some threats around me to be shields for me. Um, and then stab when we can. Um, mm -hmm. And I just don't think she – oh, thumbs up for our listeners out there. I got a new thumbs up emoji. Oh, hey, there you up go. On there. Um, but, yes, that's what I want to say on that part. Yeah. Yeah, well, it summed it up right there. Summed, summed it up. <laughs> um, all right, well, we can move to the fifth rule. And, you know – I had mentioned her methods being known and the fifth rule says players need to pretend to be nice and play the social game. And in my game changers podcast, I underestimated Sri in this rule. And I think a lot of people did previously because I said she didn't really need to pretend to be nice because she just is nice. But as we've seen here, pretending to be nice really is her superpower. As she said on the show this Tuesday, I have this uncanny knack for people to feel like I like them. I want you to feel like I love you more than anyone else in the game. Now, the problem at the end here was that Jag saw through it and knew this was why she was so dangerous. So after four seasons of Survivor, one season of the Traders, and over three months of Big Brothers, they finally figured it out. They finally figured out her superpower. And indeed, it took this long. 
And we know that it took this truly this long because even just a week earlier on the live feeds, Jack was wondering aloud why the House suddenly trusted her or had trusted her. He went back to Riley suddenly trusting her from the beginning and then everyone joining in. That was just a week ago that he was talking about that. Yeah, I mean, one thing is apparent, and I, I think it has to be said, Suri, I mean, we've never seen Suri in a game like Big Brother where we see it unedited. We see, you know, everything mm-hmm. about her. And that can be so, um, what's the word I'm looking for? But for anybody. Yeah, enlightening. I guess that's a great word. Uh, for anybody who's on the show, right? You see them, you're like, oh, wait, I love this person. Ooh, I don't know if I love this person. Mm. We saw Sari. Um, enlightening or in darkening, yes. In yeah. darkening, yeah. <laughs> I mean, with Sari, too, like any person who's stuck in 100 days, they're going to say some – they're going to be mean at points, right? Mm-hmm. And we kind of saw through it as viewers that Sari kind of hates – while she's in the house, everybody around her. Well, she was really fed up with just so many things. She's like, mm-hmm. I never want to live with any of these people anymore. I mean, but we saw her continuously put on the show. I mean, there was very few times. I mean, we did see some eh moments from her when she and Felicia were talking about other people in the house. Mm-hmm. I mean, she had also, she kind of uh, bandwagoned on the hate on America points. I mean, you know, she she didn't like blue for a lot of different reasons. All of this said, she still tried to put up a face and socially you can't beat her. I mean, I think that's the thing is um, in this game, which I think is so sad that we can't see her on a jury because I would have loved to see her kind of craft of how she would talk to that jury because we just know that's where she shines. Um, but she played nice. She pretended to be good with every single person in there. People, I mean, like just a testament to this portion of her game, Cameron and Red thought this was her trusted ally. I mean, Red said yes. he would take a bullet before he tries right. to evict her. I mean, somebody was, who she has from week one was like, yeah, I'm going to get him out. We're going to get mm-hmm. him out. And even then, she, Cameron kept coming back to her because he, she was able to miss him. I mean, that's what we talk about, her miss. And this rule is perfect for her because she truly was the queen of that. Yeah. So, all right. We're far enough into this podcast here. We're an hour in. I can tell everyone watching and listening a little secret that I've been holding on to for a while. So I've known about this for a while. Okay. Okay. I, on my survivor podcast, I sometimes mention my source, deep survivor throat, my secret source. Okay. (laughs) Well, that source also had some other information for me from a behind the scene tids bit at the traders that shows just how good Suri's social game skills are. Okay. On the traders, Suri was, of course, a traitor. The first person taken out by the traders was Reza. For some reason, production messed up. They didn't do their full press and commercial recording before that elimination. So like all the pictures they take and and stuff like that. So they had him stick around to do it after he was eliminated. They didn't just send him off. The other players were there, too, of course. And Sari apparently told him secretly she was a traitor and apologized to him. Okay, now, through some serious flaws in production, allowing people to talk to each other. Reza, I have heard, apparently told some of the others that she was a traitor and no one believed him. She was too well-liked. Her social skills were too good. So the guy who had been, quote-unquote, killed in the game and said, Suri is a traitor, no one believed him. Wow. What a oversight. This is a true um, scoop. Have you you publicly talked about this at all? No. No. Wow. That... That is a scoop right there, David. I am as surprised as anybody watching or listening to this um, to this news uh, because, like, wow, that's uh, such a blunder. But also, I mean, a testament to uh, Sari and, I mean, her ability. I mean, like, I, it's just one of those things. It's like, even if you know she wants to vote you out, you just want to be friends. It's Sari Fields, mm-hmm. you know? And I mean, if anything, she has been – she's done a very good job of using her level of – um, I, I don't want to the word fame is not the right word, but her, uh, you know, accolades to her benefit in the mm-hmm. game. I mean, people, which is surprising when you have a target that big, or if you're that person, people don't want to work with you or they want to get you out potentially not for her case. 
Yeah. And, you know, of course, with having that good of a game, it also comes with expectations from those who are in the know, which is namely Corey. He told Mike Bloom in his post-game interview, at the start of the season, I was like, wait, Sari is not nearly as good as I expected. She was being super flip-floppy and antsy and trying to flip these votes for no reason and seemed frenetic and all over the place. But as the season went on, I started to realize, oh, shoot, I understand why she's such a good player. Because you talk to her one-on-one. No matter what, you walk away from the conversation thinking, well, I feel great about Sari. I could take her to Final Four, Final Three, or Final Two. So I could see why she's such a great player. And the thing is, that happened over and over again with different players. You know, she gathered allies to be essentially Mm -hmm. running the game. Then she lost them, was on the bottom, and yet still somehow had trust with everyone. Again, she couldn't necessarily control the outcome because of the comp situation, but she was trusted and safe and could subtly maneuver things through most of the season in large part because of her social skills. No, very true. I mean, this is one of those rules where I I really don't like, I mean, at this point too, when we get to these people who are in the final five, it's Mm -hmm. sometimes really fun because when we do objectively look at their game, it's a little reverse of how we usually are like dogging on them because yeah, because you won, didn't win the game, right? Um, doesn't mean you weren't a good player by any means. I mean, there's one person who, let's face it, we're going to dog on. Yes, there yeah. is. But usually mm. the goal is when you get to this final portion yeah, of the you game. Would, you would hope that more. they would be better. Yes, we have more positives to talk to yeah. them about them than why they just you know simply lost. Yeah. All right, well, we could go to the sixth rule, which warns against being too much of a threat. And quite frankly, as I suggested earlier, this should have caused the players this season to vote out Suri in week two. And the only reason it wasn't week one is because she was safe in week one. The fact that it didn't is somewhat amazing, but can be attributed to a combination of Sari being Sari, as we just discussed, plus a bunch of players not really knowing who she was, plus the ones who did know deciding they wanted to play with her rather than getting rid of her. So like Corey and Izzy, instead of being like, oh, she's dangerous. We need to get rid of her. They're like, oh, she's Sari. We want to be near her. We want to be here with her. Um, And once she made it past the early stage, she was set up well to continue. And then, like it has been so many times before for Sari, the problem came at the end. Looking back to my old articles, I see the same pattern. For Exile Island, I wrote, the sixth rule was not a problem for Sari through most of the show, but came back to bite her near the end. It says not to not be too much of a threat. As far as challenges went, Sari was certainly no Terry or ours. As she described herself, she was essentially a couch potato. However, everything changed as the game neared its end. There was no way... And these are going to be people, hopefully, that some of you will know. But there was no way Courtney, Shane, Danielle, or Terry wanted to face Sari in the final two. Sari had to clear them out to help her own progress. She got rid of the first two, but the third one did her in. And then I added in my conclusion to that article. She got along with her fellow players. She used that to trick them into doing what she wanted to do. She used it to make them feel safe when they were about to be eliminated. But somehow she still remained the most likable participant. But as the numbers were whittled down, other players recognized that they did not stand a chance against Sari if they faced her in the final two. Continuing in that vein, in my Micronesia article, I wrote, while Sari was never thought of as a challenge threat, she was certainly a threat to win the game. Then in my Game Changers podcast, I said, (laughs) Sari should certainly have been viewed as a threat, but because she was a quieter strategic threat rather than a challenge threat, she was allowed to keep moving along in the game. And I also added, Sari is a great player, but was too threatening to be allowed to the end. I guess it's possible that Sari might have found a way if she hadn't been screwed by Advantage Geddon, but the others would have to be would have had to be complete idiots to let her get to the end. Wow. I mean, there's an arc there. There's an yeah. arc. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. It's interesting that you bring that up, and I don't want to disagree with you on this, David, because you are the king of this. Uh, <laughs> But I will say in this particular season, Big Brother, she managed her threat level so well that even by the end, I don't even think it was so much of an issue of her being a huge threat. They had to get her out. It was more so because I, I think there's a world where Jag and Matt look at 
Sari, and I, I'm not saying this is correct, but they think mm-hmm. they can beat her at the end. And I'm not saying they wouldn't. I don't know how the jury is going to vote. It's tough because they do have social right. and, like competition wins there. But I don't think they saw her as a threat. The thing is, they saw her more threatening potentially as Felicia. Um, and because Bowie Jane, I mean, here's the thing is they're not going to get out Bowie Jane. They know she's coming. Right. She's basically helping him go down there. Yeah. Um, but to them, Felicia isn't, they know, I feel like everyone knows how frustrated their uh, Felicia, everyone mm-hmm. is at Felicia. So by fact though, it becomes, you know, Sari. And even though then I think Sari had the ability, can we talked about it earlier to kind of convince Matt to, Hey, don't come at me. Don't mm-hmm. get me out right now. I think she probably played her threat level the best way you could in this game. I mean, this is essentially uh, with uh, without the advantages side, Paul level, threat level, um, trying to manage it. You know, somebody who comes into the house with such a huge target who should be from the get go taking out somebody who they find out their son is there. I mean, Izzy found she's right. able to make him a net social game right there. But her threat level, I don't think was ever a reason people tried targeting her. Yeah, I mean, I would I would agree. You know, she kept her threat level. She wasn't a threat in challenges. She kept her threat level low through most of the game. But I do think once it came time for people to really think about who they'd be sitting next to at the end, they realized it couldn't be Suri. You know, and part of it was comparison. Like you said, Jag noted she was a much more dangerous and strategic player than Felicia. Uh, he added that she hadn't burned any bridges and she had better jury management. Mm-hmm. You know, heaven forbid he should improve his own jury management. <laughs> no, he just gets rid of the people who have better jury management. Uh, which is an option Uh, for him. It was further complicated by the fact that Matt was close to her and he didn't want Matt to have any options. You know, I mean, he went so far as to say things have never uh, things that have never been said about Suri before claiming that she was a bigger comp threat than Felicia. Suri was a bigger comp threat than somebody really, Um, (laughs) you know, that's how desperate he was to get Matt to cave. Now, eventually Matt did give in as we discussed earlier, which, was potentially bad for his own game, but obviously much worse for Suri's game. Yeah, I mean, I think, like you said, it it, it just becomes a uh, comparison. You know, sometimes mm-hmm. it's like um, when you have food options in front of you, you know, restaurants there, and neither of them are very good options, but you just pick out which one's better. Yeah, you know, Chili's and Applebee's. I like Chili's, but you're going to go with Chili's, you know, over the Applebee's. Yeah. It's not prime eating. And by that comparison, I'm just saying that, you don't have a huge like threat level between Felicia and Sari there. Um, it's 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 super impressive. You would never think that mm-hmm. going into the game, right? Like that she was able to get to where she did in the game and still miss people and think I'm like, oh man, she's very beatable. I yeah. Mean, she, I don't know. I mean, I think near the end they started to realize, oh, she might not be so beatable. I think that it did eventually dawn on them. It was partially comparison to Felicia and partially just realizing, oh, wow, she really, I mean, you know, we, we talked about earlier, Jag saw through her superpower, you know, and if, if she could work that on Jag, she could have worked it on the jury too. And so Mm. it, it would have been interesting to see how it would have ended up. You know, we could look at some of the numbers and try to guess, but we, we don't know. Well, again, yeah. Choose your own adventure book. Not, you know, not here. Um, we need to go into one of those Marvel parallel universes, <laughs> you know. Um, but I do, I do want to mention something that's a little bit different in this rule, and I also want to rebut it because uh, I've heard some people say this. So near the end of Sari's time there, Jag and Matt were clearly in control. Sari and Felicia supposedly had a Final Four deal with them. Some have said Felicia caused a problem not only for herself but also for Suri because of her behavior trying to make Suri look bad in you know those days leading up to it but the reality is none of that mattered I've seen some people say oh that's why they got rid of Suri is because what Felicia was saying that's why they ended up sticking with Bowie Jane no Suri and Felicia were always a backup (laughs) alliance okay they you know Jag and Matt were always going with Bowie Jane Unless something weird happened and Felicia or Suri won HOH mm-hmm. and got Bowie Jane out. That was the only way that they were going with those two. If they had their choice, which, of course, they did, you know, despite Felicia insisting for days on end 
Why are you doing this? If we're a final four, we're a final four, we're a final four. You were never a final four, Felicia. Get it through your head. You were always a backup alliance. Yeah. I mean, who wouldn't choose to go to the end with Bowie Jane instead, really? <laughs> yes. Competition definitely. beast, Bowie Jane. Yes. Yes. Um, all right. Well, we can go to the seventh rule, which says to trust almost nobody. And Sari obviously trusted Jared. And she should. He's her son. Uh, but we've discussed through the season and in this podcast how, at least in my view, that was a detriment to her. He simply was not trustworthy. Now, I'm not saying he did things against her on purpose. Even telling Blue, you know, it wasn't meant to be against her. He was just trying to make himself look better. But he was just a bad player, and he trusted the wrong people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I think she this is a part where the advantage becomes a disadvantage right there's only so mm-hmm. much information you can leak i think it's more pros and cons i do think and i've seen a lot of people talk about it there were points where after jared was gone i don't think it's the worst thing for her to tell some people about that connection she had oh god no um and oh, i think god, no. i i think if she told felicia <laughs> you and i have whole, disagreed before but i don't know that i've ever disagreed really no i completely once strongly. jared was I, once Jared was gone pre-jury, I think she would have – if she told Felicia and Nicole about that relationship with Jared, I think it would have cleared out a lot of the differences they would have had. Oh, I, think I she, don't they, think so. I think you Felicia don't think would so? have – I think Felicia would have – I mean, we saw Felicia using stuff against her, twisting her words. I think she would have immediately – if maybe not immediately, but at some point, she would have run to the others and said – she had her son in the house helping her. We got to get rid of her. That wasn't fair. I absolutely I, you think so? do I, not I, think there was ever a point when she should say anything. Ah, uh, so I, cause I think there was. I I think when it was at the worst of the relationship where Felicia and Nicole were basically going away. I think if she had it, I think I think it would have because I I don't think it would have been looked at as a threat anymore. I think maybe the only person I, I I'll, I'll give you this. I think the person who would go out for blood because that would be Cameron. I think he'd been oh man. Well, yeah. But I think Corey would have been figured out a way like oh that's actually it's interesting how that happened. That makes a lot of sense why you probably mm-hmm. felt the way you did. I think Felicia and Nicole would have came on her side. I mean this is an alternate universe, right? Um, we will never know. But Corey might have kept the secret. Although the thing is, here's the problem. She tells Corey, Corey tells America, because Corey mm-hmm. kept no secrets from America. America tells Jag and Blue, and then everybody knows. Because yeah. we already talked about America can't keep any, couldn't keep any secrets. So again, in that house, you tell one person, you tell the whole house. I know, but I just think also uh, it's just such a luck of the draw that Blue never used it against her in any shape or form. You know, I just feel like it, it, at that point, when you know if Blue knows or if there's a you know there's that hint of there, I think you try to get ahead of the game. But you know, it didn't end up that being way. But I I do think to the point with even Blue, she didn't trust her at all mm-hmm. after the fact. Jared was even gone, really. I mean, so minuscule, it just hindered her uh, game. They, so yeah, yeah. I, I I you know we never know what would have happened. Mm-hmm. Um, but. She, she, I don't think we can say she trusted too many people in this situation. The only thing right. is, she probably, in my opinion, maybe trusted a little too less. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I mean, she said there was no way she was going to tell anyone, and I agree with her. I don't think you share that with anyone at any time. And the other thing is, let's say she does tell someone, okay, and she makes it to final two. You know, some people in that jury house are going to say the same thing that you said and that other and that other people have been saying much more, which is she had an unfair advantage. Why should we give her the win when she had an unfair advantage? And so I, I, I just don't think there's any way she should. have. I think she was absolutely right to keep that a total secret. You don't think Blue has spoken about it at all, though, nope. in the jury house? You know, hmm. No. Nope. OK. Nope. This is granted. Yeah. Um. Now, there was one other person that she trusted pretty heavily, not enough to tell that secret to, uh, but that was, of course, Matt. And, you know, she brought him into the fold early in the game, tried to mold him into part of the field's family, and it seemed to work, but the problem was Matt was not only, Matt was clay. He was not only moldable by her, 
He also was moldable, moldable and didn't really have much of a spine when it came to other people, especially Jack. Matt wanted Suri around. He knew that his chances were better with her in Final Four as compared to Felicia. And yet was he, when he was HOH, supposedly the most powerful position in the game, the whole time he and Jag made a big deal, don't go against what the HOH wants. You have to agree on everything. He let Jag walk all over him. First, he nominated Suri to avoid making Bowie Jane feel bad. Oh, boo-hoo, boo-hoo, don't worry. She doesn't want to be nominated. Who cares, nominator? Then he eventually caved to Jag's plan to evict her. Now, as it turned out with Jag winning the veto, maybe the nomination part wouldn't have mattered anyway if Jag was going to go against what Matt wanted. Um, and it's true. The HOH, as much as we say it's the powerful position, they don't have any real control once the nominations are set. We talked about that with Cameron when Izzy mm -hmm. ended up being voted out. Um, but still, the HOH almost always has some sort of influence, especially with this group. Matt didn't want to cause friction with Jag, but Jag had no problem causing friction with Matt, so Matt caved in. Yeah, I mean, we, we saw that where it comes down, I mean, this it's so interesting that we can kind of potentially point out one portion that would have so intrinsically changed the game for Suri mm -hmm. as if she went to talk to him and didn't let Jag to push out. And kudos to Jag. He knew what he had to do. He yeah. pushed that on there when he wasn't even in a position of power, it could have backfired mm -hmm. on him. And he really pushed the pushed that out there. Um yeah, I guess you know that's that's a portion where we can point out what if. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well we can move to Appendix A, which is about the jury phase of the game and deals with how both how Suri will impact the final outcome plus how the remaining players acted, whether they needed, you know, did what they needed to do. And to start with, I think it's pretty clear that they were right to send her to jury instead of trying to face off against her at the end. We discussed that already mm -hmm. at some length, but I, I just think if, if we're sitting here going, Ooh, who would have won? We don't know. That makes it too much of a risk. And they had to get rid of her. Yeah, no, I mean, she she was such a jury threat. I mean, we mm -hmm. it, between what they had left to, I mean, we know they were a jury threat. And then when you compare it to Felicia and Bowie Jane from Matt and Jag's mm -hmm. purview, you're like, mm, it, it, she can't be around here. Right. Uh, what I'm interested to, I mean, this kind of on the inverse of this, David. Mm -hmm. We talked about kind of in our initial, you know, uh, conversations of things outside the rules. How do we feel about, you know, we, we don't like the behavior of Bowie Jane, Matt and Jag of how they've been acting this week where mm -hmm. they've kind of been just uh, mean to both Suri yeah. and uh, Felicia for no reason, how that will impact the jury portion of it. I mean, th and they're all equally mean, though, right? So well, in this yeah, situation, um, it, it, it is interesting the way they went about it. I mean, they. They kept most of their. Most of their bad behavior, like their ideas of making, uh, you know, Felicia crack under the pressure. They talked about it and they never really carried through on it. You know, I, so we saw it. We saw how intent they were on it. We saw them bring it up multiple times. But, you know, Felicia didn't see it. Now, she did see things are wrong. You can see watching the feeds right now. There are the three of them and there's Felicia playing solitaire or Felicia by herself or, you know, whatever. You know, the three of them stumbling around trying to figure out how to cook a meal because Felicia isn't doing it for them. Um, and so it, it's she definitely feels excluded by mm -hmm. them. And but when, even when Sri was still there. The lies. It was so ridiculous. Felicia and Suri just kept saying, just tell us who's going. Just tell us who's going. We're not going to, you know, we're, we're done. Just tell us. And Matt and Jag just kept saying, we don't know. We don't know. We're still debating it. You might be safe. You are safe. They kept promising safety and then saying, well, we don't know. And so, but the, the thing is, the odds are that two of those three 
will be the final two. So Suri and Felicia will have to pick one of them. So, you know, if it's if it's Jag versus Matt in Suri's case, she was already leaning heavily Matt. And I think Jag's behavior sealed the deal. If it's anyone versus Bowie Jane, then it's whoever isn't Bowie Jane. Uh, so it doesn't matter. I mean, really, yes, Bowie Jane was behaving badly. Jag, Matt were behaving badly. It doesn't matter. You're not picking Bowie Jane. If by some miracle, Felicia makes it to the end, I think Sari would probably vote for her despite all the toenail and other hygiene issues. And this may have contributed to it, but the odds of that are just so slim. Mm. It, it, it is very slim. There's a world where it could be. I wonder if there's a world where they could be bitter enough against Matt and Jag to give Bowie Jane um, a win. But more than that, how do you think? I know that's your nightmare right there. Um, but more than that, let me know. What do you think about her impact on the jury house? How do you feel like she's going to do you think she's going to take the leadership role of the jury house and navigate and push her thing? Or is she going to sit back and let it be? Ah, that's a good question. I mean, she won't be there for terribly long. She'll be there for, what, less than a week by the time she gets there and then the time they take them out. We've heard from other past jurors that, you know, there are handlers with them all the time that try to put the kibosh on mm -hmm. discussions like that, although, you know, it, it they can't stop it all the time. Um. <sighs> It's a good question. And then you'll have the jury roundtable, of course. Um, I think she can't help but provide her opinions on the matter. Mm. You know, I, I, I don't think she can fully sit back. I mean, I know she's she's done with it. You know, she feels done with it. But I still don't think that she can help. And I think she's going to push for Matt over Jag if that's the choice. So but I, I also think, yeah, that'll be interesting. Yeah, I, I don't. I actually don't know, and I think it's going to be interesting to see where she was taken out. She'll have a little bit more time with the jury because we weren't sure if it would be Sari this week. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, of course, there was indicators, but if she had right. less time with them, uh, say if she was evicted Sunday or mm -hmm. somehow made final three, then she would have no time with the jury. So I'm interested yeah. to see what her impact will be had on the jury there. Yeah, yeah. But with that, it is about time to wrap things up. So, what are your final thoughts about Sari? Wow. I mean, I'm just, you know, uh, grateful that I was able to watch her in live time play a game that I just love to watch. You know, seeing her make that crossover between Survivor and Big Brother is never easy. We've seen some players in the past who've done it um, from Big Brother to Survivor. It, there's just like a, a shift in it. But I think if there's one thing that's proven um, is Sari feels regardless of the reality show she's on, whether the social game um here in Survivor or in Big Brother or in Traders, she will never let it falter. I mean, she had really a crazy uh, roller coaster in the game from battling from the bottom uh, or from the top to the bottom, had her own son on here. I think this is going to be a season no matter what from uh, – whoever wins we're gonna watch mm -hmm. back or think back this is a serif field season i think this is stamped in their bb 25 is her season um for her game itself i think it was very impressive for how she was able to play with such a threat in there yes did she overplay at times yes did Sari and co do too much in my opinion uh yeah but it's a hundred day game and for her to make it to basically uh not basically i said the final five would also mm -hmm. a, a solid shot of trying to maneuver there um against two who she's going against are two um generational comp beasts i mean regardless of whether we like it or not i mean the, the numbers mm -hmm. speak for themselves they've they've absolutely just yes. smashed it uh is really impressive so uh was sad to see her go but was very happy i got to watch almost 100 days of Sari fields yes yeah, Sari came into the game with what should have been a big red arrow pointed at her saying, vote me out right away. Uh, but she overcame that just as she has in the past. Uh, she also had to play the game for two as she tried to cover for what Jared was doing. While she essentially directed the game in the first half or so of the season, Jared's mistakes eventually caught up for Sari's side, and she lost much of her obvious power. But being Sari, she was able to recover, regroup, and go into a lower profile mode that allowed her to still work some magic from the shadows. Along the way, Jag and Matt just grew too powerful thanks to being able to win almost all the comps. 
Suri dodged them for a while by downplaying her threat level. But eventually, when everyone who could be considered a physical competitor was gone, Jag turned his eyes on the biggest actual game threat and finally realized she could not be allowed to make it to the end. Part of this was that her still being there at this point could potentially help Matt. Part of it was the pure threat level of her very presence. As we've discussed, Suri's games have often followed a similar path. If the Big Brother comps were more generally equitable, maybe things would have been different. But this was the game she was playing. She should have been seen as a big threat from the moment she showed up pouring drinks for the other players. But it took three months for some of them to finally realize it. And that is why Suri lost. Wow. All right. Congratulations, well, David. I got to say that first. I mean, you have now recapped Suri in... Every show she's been every on. Every show she's ever been lifetime. on. Lifetime. And I don't Except know for how- not Snake in the Grass. I don't think that I was on a podcast about Snake in the Grass. I, I talked about it on Twitter, but. I don't think, honestly, I don't think anyone, I don't know how many people were even knew yes. about that show beforehand. Yes. Um, but congratulations, David, for basically this whole journey as well. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, you know, she was my backup winner pick. Uh, which uh, now I have no winner picks left and you still have your original in Matt. Uh, but before we go into our predictions, uh, remember they will be spoiler free. So even though as of the time we're recording this, it's known, I mean, we saw on the show who won HOH, but it's known who won, you know, who the nominations were and who's won veto. We made these predictions. We wrote down these predictions mm-hmm. before all that happened. Uh, so, uh, you know, we'll get to that in a second. But if you want our full spoilery thoughts, including like my reactions to all those things I just talked about, we are all over social media. Exactly. We are all over social media. You can find us talking about Big Brother Survivor right now. David is doing, I don't even want to say double duty. I think it's triple duty. He's on so many social media platforms talking about shows. Uh, on Twitter, I am at the Obi Kabir. On Instagram, I'm at Obi Kabir. And on TikTok, I am at Basmati Boy. David, you can find him in various ways, but you can find him directly on his link tree at linktree slash David Bloomberg. And you can find him on most text based social media like Twitter and Blue Sky, which he just actually had an argument on Blue Sky. So you should go over there, check it out. It's is at David Bloomberg and on video platforms like TikTok, YouTube, and Instagram is at David Bloomberg TV. But additionally, since threads connected to Instagram, it's at David Bloomberg TV there as well. Yeah, since uh, Big Brother has started, I've been posting three or sometimes four videos per day at TikTok, YouTube, and Instagram, uh, sometimes even more. We've, you know, got thoughts on what we see on Big Brother and Survivor. Uh, We've had stuff, you know, I've had stuff from the live feeds, obviously less of that now. Uh, You know, now there's going to be going forward, you know, still some Big Brother, uh, but from, you know, a lot from Survivor, from the Traders Canada, from Survivor UK, from House of Villains. There'll, There'll still be plenty to see on there even when Big Brother ends. And speaking of all those other shows, or at least some, you know, most of them. You mentioned I have been doing, you know, double, triple, quadruple duty. Yes, I've been doing, <laughs> you know, why blank lost double duty uh, podcasting, you know, for a while now since Survivor started. And so shortly before this podcast was released, my why blank lost for Survivor 45 with Jessica Lewis, uh, the mergatory episode that came out. So be sure to watch or listen to that if you haven't already. And then on top of that, I'm recapping and analyzing the Traders Canada on the Tradar podcast, which, uh, you know, that is spelled T-R-A-I-D-A-R. So you can find that on your usual podcast host or as as audio on YouTube. And on top of that, I'm doing a special series for the Tradar podcast on Survivor UK, where I am recapping with a co-host who is in the UK and has never seen Survivor before. So it is an interesting blend of thoughts. He has, he, you know, he's a reality TV fan, but Survivor hasn't been on in the UK for over 20 years. So he hadn't seen it. And so he's watching it and he's seeing these different things and reacting and I'm reacting to this version. So it, it's an interesting mix, if I do say so myself. <laughs> Truly all over the place. Yes, Uh, Now, it is time for our predictions. So, there's a special live eviction coming Sunday night to get them down to a Final Four. Then, of course, is the finale on Thursday. 
we aren't 100% sure as we sit here right now whether we will have one or two more podcasts. It will depend on several factors. We might separately cover whoever is evicted on Sunday, or we might just do a full Final Four version of why blank won and the other three lost after the finale. So just in case we aren't able to get to a special podcast after the Sunday eviction, let's you know make our final predictions now. So you mentioned, Ovi, that there was someone arguing with me over on Blue Sky. And the argument was that Bowie Jane is the queen and that she is a great player. The queen. In part because she won two and then eventually three comps, Mm -hmm. despite the fact that one was by accident and one was thrown to her. And, of course, despite the fact that, as we discussed when it came to Julie's opinions, comp wins do not make someone a good player. This guy also claimed that Bowie Jane could beat Felicia in the final two, which makes no sense for multiple reasons. The most obvious being, well, there's no way that's going to happen ever. And the second reason is that the only way it happens is if Felicia wins comps and brings Bowie Jane, which seems unlikely. My point in all of that is that of all the different stands we have talked about, yes, there are Bowie Jane stands. And they are just as irrational as, you know, the other various stands like the camp stands. Um, This person was literally the first that I've ever had to mute on Blue Sky because he just would not shut up (laughs) or accept any rational response. And all of this I'm mentioning, you're like, what does this have to do with your prediction, David? Uh, It's because Bowie Jane won't win. She said on the show she doesn't think she could beat Matt. Bowie Jane could not beat the shower mat in the house. It doesn't matter who you put her up against. It could be an empty chair. She cannot win. Wow. That is a blunt but understandable treatment of this house. Yes, <laughs> to has now probably is the, uh, f- the fourth most wins in this house, this house at this point, which is kind of sad. Um, I think I'm curious to see what's going to happen here. I mean, We know Bowie Jane won this. Mm -hmm. I wonder, is there a world where whether she orchestrates or somebody orchestrates it else, Matt or Jag go home. One of them gets cut. And then Bowie Jane takes her competition ability and wins the final three competition. Wins that and decides, you know what? I'm going to take Felicia with me. And we get a final two, Bowie Jane and Felicia. Bowie Jane wins. She wins in that situation. And I hate to see. Well, one, I, I don't think. So. Well, OK, I, I'm going to. You don't Sorry. think she beats Felicia no. in that situation? No, no I do not. Way. I do not. I, with, with the way people talked about her going to the end, I mean, going to jury. You know, Blue was asked by Mike Bloom, you know, to do name associate word association. Said Bowie Jane. Her response was who? Uh, America was asked and she just had a whole litany of, you know, this was supposed to be single word association. She had a litany of bad things to say. Felicia had a social game. You didn't always agree with it, but she had a social game. She was liked in the house. Bowie Jane was not, especially with the heel turn she took at the end. I do not see, I mean, Maybe she gets Cameron's vote, but I, she also turned on Cameron. I, I don't, I, like I said, she can't beat Jag. She can't beat Felicia. She can't beat Matt. She can't beat an empty chair. Interesting. I, cause here in this situation, I just don't think, um, Felicia's social game will overcome the fact that Bowie Jane have, would have gotten Cameron, America, Matt, and Jag in that situation all out. I don't think, you know, uh, but we should put it on there. If this is a situation, I'll put my mm-hmm. bet it on if, if there's a final tune between Felicia and Bowie Jane, I'll put my bet on Bowie Jane. OK, all right? well, I don't think it'll happen anyway, because probably not, because let's face it. Felicia is very unlikely to win the veto, uh-huh. you know, and with that being the case, I don't think whoever does win will send her out. Um, So, I, I mean. I want her to win it, so there will be some disruption. Exactly, it just yep. seems very unlikely. I, I, you know, I know that Jag and Bowie Jane have talked about getting rid of Matt. 
but I think both of them fear Felicia getting to final two. Mm -hmm. I don't think, well, first of all, I don't think Bowie Jane would cut Matt or Jag at this point to go to the end with Felicia. It would go against her so-called personal ethics, I believe. Um, Beyond that, I, I, I think they want to save Matt till the end. And then for Jag, if he wins, it's easier to explain why he turned on his fellow Minuteman for a final two against Bowie Jane than it is to say why he kept Felicia around. If Matt wins the veto, I think he'll get rid of Felicia because he just seems more loyal to Jag overall. So I think no matter what, Felicia goes on Sunday unless Felicia wins the veto herself. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's a possibility for sure. Probably the most, probably 85, 90% there. But mm -hmm. I do wonder if this is a chance. And that's where I'm going to predict that either Jag or Matt go home on Sunday. And I would hate that because I think Matt is my winner pick. So if he doesn't win Vito, he is in mm -hmm. big trouble. Um, and if Jag wins it, I just don't know. I don't. Here's the thing is in my vision though i don't know if matt cuts anybody other than felicia i wouldn't be surprised though if jag wins he cuts matt because right again it comes down to this jag is playing a game of, as of a phoenix he has already been voted mm -hmm. out he's in here now he's balls to the wall he wants to win this game he's doing whatever he has to do okay and so for him he doesn't care about the brotherhood. He he has he has uh, his twin brother back home. He cares about them. His, <laughs> his non-twin, his not twin brother. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, he he is. Um, I think ready to make that move, and I think if he does do that, he believes in himself that he can win the final three competition. And I wouldn't yeah. put it past him. I I do think that of the two of them, Matt would not do it. Jag, there's a possibility. I just think Jag wouldn't do it either. I think Jag. Yeah has enough confidence in himself that he can wait until the next vote. Um, so if Felicia goes, as I think will happen, and it's a mafia final three, I <laughs> predict that Jag will win the final HOH because why wouldn't he? And he'll cut Matt at that point. Um, and then I think he'll win seven to nothing. Or I guess it's possible someone throws a rogue vote in and it's six to one. But I really think it will be a seven to nothing vote. Jag beats Bowie Jane. Bowie Jane wins seventy five thousand dollars for doing nothing all season. And then Sri wins fifty thousand dollars as America's favorite player. Yeah, she has she has to beat Cameron for that one. It's gonna be a competition. I know, and that's the thing. It I worry a little bit about the vote splitting because you, there are people out there going, vote Corey. I, I like Corey a lot. If Sari were not there, I would be voting Corey. Mm -hmm. There are people out there, vote America. I like America a lot. I like Sari more. Sorry. I think Corey would understand that. <laughs> and I think we have to unite because the cam stands are united. They are united front. <laughs> and I yeah. think if we split the vote, it, you know, you're just risking giving it to Cam. 100%. I think I, I, I unfortunately, I don't, I think Cam's going to win. I think Cam's going to win this wow. AFP. I don't, I think it's too nice to split. I don't think Sari has the bulk of the whole fandoms one. I mean, I think she has a majority of the fandoms, like the people who are mm -hmm. huge fans of it. I think between America, Corey, um maybe some matt jag boats there um she's she's probably i don't think she can beat cameron but i will say this regardless of who wins i really am excited to see either matt or jag win i think both for both of them will be a historic win i mean as players mm -hmm. um i've enjoyed this season i really have and i just you know honestly seeing another brown man there having a chance to win mm -hmm. that is super exciting for me i mean jag like love it or hate it I don't, uh, I want to throw, this is not a Chris Underwood game. You know, he didn't come right at the end. It was, he came, he, he had something to happen and it happened to him. He has no control over that. It, it did. And he was back in the game. And so he can't just play like, he, oh, I shouldn't win. You know, he has done everything he can do, regardless of whether it's sometimes smashing his head against the wall <laughs> in the right time, but to win this game. And I love seeing, I love seeing players 
try to win the game. So between Matt and Jag, I've just appreciated that. I've appreciated watching him, excuse me, try to like win it to get that money. Don't care about other people around them and let's see what we can do. Um, yes, there's other things around there where like, ah, that sucks to see. Mm-hmm. But uh, overall, I've enjoyed the season and I'm excited to see how it's going to end. Yeah, I mean, like you mentioned Chris Underwood and, you know, back when Jessica and I talked about why Chris won, we were very clear. We hated the twist. We hated that he was not in the game for very long, but he played the game that was presented to him. And we discussed Mm -hmm. how he won, why he won and what he needed to do. Jag, if Jag wins, you and I will go through that same discussion. Yes, he was voted out. Now, did he ever walk out of the house? No, he literally never left the house. So... Although he was voted out, and there is an asterisk to the win, you could say, if he wins, he still played the game that was in front of him. Do I think that it was geared towards a certain type of person in terms of the comps? Yes, I absolutely do. He played the game that was given to him. Everybody has to play the game that's given to them. All we can do is argue and hope that it will change for the better to make it more even in the future. But we'll decide that when you know you know when we eventually get to the our our final podcast whether well i was gonna say whether it's you know next time or not it'll be our final podcast no matter what once it's (laughs) after the after the finale um so yeah we'll you know we'll talk about that more when we get there Exactly. And as we wrap up, I want to encourage people to check out our RHAP pro- patron program at robhasawebsite.com slash patron. Rob has so many patron only podcasts for Big Brother, Survivor that I've truly lost can. So jump on board and support shows like ours and everything on the network by becoming a patron at robhasawebsite.com slash patron. And make sure you're subscribed to all the RHAP podcasts by going to our YX Lost feed page or subscribe directly to the RHAP Big Brother feed at robhaswebsite.com slash Big Brother. You'll find a ton of great content there. Uh, of course, obviously, the Big Brother feed's starting to go down a little bit here. So maybe you want to just subscribe to all of the rehap ups or all of the RHAP stuff. But, you know, also subscribe to Big Brother so that when Big Brother starts up again in, you know, a few weeks, probably, they'll just throw another season up there with legends like Ovi. Then, um, we'll, uh, you know, you'll already be subscribed. Exactly. And finally, we want to thank Scott St. Pierre and the whole RJP and Reality TV wrap-ups behind the scenes team for all the work they do, editing and posting and everything else. We really appreciate everything they do to get our voices from our microphones to your ears. And finally, I can't end this without thanking all of you all. This is probably one of our longest episodes, so thank you for listening or watching wherever you might be. Thank you for being just so committed to commenting and letting us know your thoughts week in and week out, whether you agree or disagree with us. We'd love to hear it. Let us know what you think for this final uh, end game of who you think is going to win and what what do you think we got right or wrong regarding Siri Fields game? Um, and make sure you tune in. I believe on David and my social media, we'll let you guys know uh, specifically David, check his out, keep following him on him. So you can know if we're going to post uh, this upcoming Sunday episode. Yes. Yes. And thanks to you, Ovi, of course, for joining me again this week. Uh, and, you know, I know it's really prep, you know, so you can get into the mindset for, for that legend season, but <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, we'll be back either shortly after the Sunday eviction for one more Why Blank Lost before the finale or more likely, frankly, after the finale to discuss Why Blank won and the other three lost. Uh, we'll see you then. And of course, you know, you could see me all over the place before then. But whichever it is, we will see you soon. Bye. <laughs>